Right now, the world could do with a bit of laughter, and there's nowhere more giving in this department than Britain, except maybe North Korea, but that's because communism is, in theory, hilarious. Anyway, there is one country that appreciates British comedy almost as much as Britain does. America. From Monty Python to the British office to Prime Minister's questions, the good old US of A learns 148% of what it knows about Britain from its televisual humour. To this day, American friends, colleagues and relatives seem to think that the best way to strike conversation with yours truly, that's me by the way, is to insist, oh man, what about flying circus? But just for once, I'd love it if those of the Yank persuasion, who I nonetheless love with all my hearts, would find a different go-to, a more obscure laughter-driven show from the belly of Britannicosaurus Rex. What the heck was that? Anyway, here are five comedies that should have made it big in America. While Monty Python might be the biggest British comedic export outside of the Spice Girls, one of its crew, a certain Eric Idle, was responsible for the theme song to the first entry on our list. One Foot in the Grave, a decidedly non-Python-esque sitcom about a disgruntled old man and his long-suffering wife, was a huge hit in the 1990s. Like many laughter track driven comedies of its time, the show also relied quite heavily on catchphrases, specifically Victor Meldrew's I don't believe it, but for all its adherence to an almost hackneyed, tried and tested formula, it interspersed the laughter with some, at times, genuinely poignant moments concerning the ageing process and death itself. British comedy is good at occasionally tugging at the heartstrings. Just ask fans of our next show. OK, so Blackadder did get a bit of airtime in the US, but nothing like on the scale that it should have. After all, it delivers all the things about Britain that the odd American, sometimes very odd American, would love. Uh, British history, British accents, Hugh Laurie with a British accent, and Rowan Atkinson in pantaloons. No? Just me then. Blackadder consists of four different series, or seasons if you'd prefer, each from the point of view of the titular character and each taking place in different but no less violent eras of British history. The Blackadder is set at the end of Richard III's reign, Blackadder II during Elizabeth I's reign, Blackadder III during the Regency period, and Blackadder goes forth during World War I. With Rowan Atkinson's perfect comic timing and brutal sarcastic wit, the Blackadder canon truly begins to take shape with Blackadder II, and I would advise starting here, making sure to watch through to the emotional climax of Goes Forth. A little piece of trivia for you, Blackadder was conceived by Rowan Atkinson and Richard Curtis, yes, the very same Richard Curtis who wrote Four Weddings and a Funeral and Love Actually, while the two worked together on Not the Nine O'Clock News. And speaking of satirical news shows... John's. Back in the early to mid-90s, when John Major was UK Prime Minister, John Stewart was a struggling TV host, and John Oliver was doing A-levels, Britain was swarming with satirical news programmes, but for me there was one programme that rose above them all. It was the brainchild of Armando Iannucci and this man, Chris Morris. Chris Morris is sort of a god among men. His deadpan Jeremy Paxman-esque delivery of surreal news headlines such as Boiled dog could do maths, claims experimenter, was just part of what made the day to day so unflinchingly hilarious. In stark contrast to The Daily Show, the day to day's sharp satirical sword was not always pointed at the breaking news stories of the day, but at the style, presentation, and all conquering personality of news media. From its intentionally drawn out title sequences to its unfathomable news graphics, The Day to Day took the news to task and, for six great episodes, won. It was a TV show shot to ribbons in its prime, but oh, how Britain and America could do with the likes of Chris Morris right now. Still, a lasting treasure did emerge from the day to day. The show gave us the first television appearance of our next entry. Years before Ricky Gervais made us cringe in the British and some would say completely superior version of The Office discussed below, Steve Coogan was doing the same in a fly on the wall mockumentary of his own. As Alan Partridge, Steve Coogan, who Americans might know from Tropic Thunder, The Trip and the poorly conceived around the world in 80 days, plays a failed disc jockey who spends 182 days in a travel tavern. Played with considerable naturalism, Partridge often cuts a frustrated figure especially when trying to get the green light on a second series from his BBC boss or trying to make pornography appear on his hotel television. Oh, wait, I've just remembered I'm Lawrence, not Partridge. In recent years, the character of Partridge has taken on extra depth with cutting dialogue in display in the rather splendid and tremendous Mid-Morning Matters. 
Uh, and though this very video, the one you're watching right now, is about British comedies that never saw the light of day in Yankadactyl Do, you can still catch Sir Alan of Partridge on Netflix in his highly acclaimed film Alpha Papa. Uh, some Partridge trivia for you. In one episode of I'm Alan Partridge, eagle-eyed viewers might notice a certain Simon Pegg from Shaun of the Dead, a film that many Brits consider to be a direct follow-up to our final entry. It was a cult series that spoke to 20-somethings of the Star Wars generation in a way nothing had before, except, you know, Star Wars. Its pop culture references, fast-paced editing, Ben Burtt-style sound effects, and sharp, sharp dialogue made this a winner for its writers Jessica Stevenson, now Hines, and Peg. It's a story about two strangers, Tim and Daisy, who rent a flat in London under the guise that they are a professional couple. Enter Tim's best friend Mike, played by Nick Frost, because who else, and a host of other finely conceived characters and you have one of the greatest and most underappreciated comedies of all time. Seriously, go to Netflix right now. It's on there as a DVD title only. But get it anyway, or I'll set Dwayne Benzi onto you, a.k.a. roommate from Shaun of the Dead, a.k.a. the voice of Darth Maul. Obviously, there are many more British comedies that could have made the list, so why not tell us about them in the comments section below? For more Lost in the Pond videos, don't forget to subscribe. Aha! That, uh, I no longer do that phrase.